Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be tuning us in from. Jason, this is episode, we are, I always have to look, we are approaching 80. I think we're at 79, or are we actually spot on? We're getting no, really close this up. Is, this is 80, my friend. That, 80 that's episodes. what I thought. I thought this might be. So we're actually, we were just chatting before we came on air. This whole thing started coming up on two years ago on World Backup Day, which is March 31st, 2020. Lots happened in the world uh, since then. In some regards, maybe not enough has changed. So we'll keep soldiering on. But Jason, also in that same kind of time frame, actually a little longer, we've been engaged together, you and myself and our good colleague, Julie Webb, in a global research report we call Data Protection Research. We're going to double click on that. And I want to tee it over to you to tell us, first off, what that is before we start unpacking some things. We do want to invite, though, everyone, give us a shout out where you're tuning in from. We're going to hit a global map from time to time. So go ahead and feel free to comment on where you're viewing. You can see some of the production team where we're located, Colorado, Texas, Georgia, in the United States. And live on our stream, we also have support and production assistance coming out of Romania. But give us a shout out where you're tuning in from. Or, Jason, we always like to say give us a comment or a question Yes, as please. well, and we'll definitely try to address that. So with that as a tee-up, meaning we're going to talk about a four-part series of some new research, what is this new research? Yeah, so uh, really excited. Uh, this is actually, we're going to be doing sneak peek. So the report actually comes out on February 22nd, so 15 days from now. Um, but uh, And to give uh, folks some history, uh, Veeam, like many other uh, um, uh, industry uh, firms, we try to figure out where the date, where the company's going, where the industry is going, where customers want data protection to go. And prior to Dave and I joining Veeam, uh, you know, Veeam had published this thing called the Veeam Availability Report. Um, for a couple of years, once upon a time. Uh, then, uh, Dave, you're coming up on your four-year anniversary. I just had my four-year anniversary. And so right about that time, we got a chance to take this over. And so we get to kind of put on our analyst hat every now and then. You, former Gartner, me, former ESG. And we've really kind of exploded what this research is. This will actually be the largest independently driven uh, analyst research project, it's 3,393, let's just call it 3,400 responses from 28 different countries around the world looking at what are they doing in modernizing in production? How does that affect their protection strategy? What's next uh, for them in 2022 for budgets, for uh, SLAs, for uh, where's the cloud fit in? Just a lot of just macro drivers on what's driving the data protection industry. And since we use an independent analyst firm to go and get the data for us, no one knows it's Veeam until after it's right. all done, largest independent research project ever. Um, so pretty excited to be showing just a little bit of it with you this week. Yeah, what I like about this is almost exactly at this time last year, we said the largest ever, and that was a N or sample size of 3,000. Now it's you, your point, we've added almost another half a thousand that basically let's call it 400 additional. So 3,400, we're, we're the largest now than the largest yet again. So I guess that makes us one and two. I don't know how that works, but probably something like that. And what I like about this is it's not, you know, just two people's view or even a company's view, meaning every company tries hard to listen to the market, tries hard to listen to their customers, their partners. But there's no getting around the fact that sometimes it's good to have a very, very large sample that's completely unbiased. And I'll tell you a quick story before we jump into the data. I used to be at a, let's call it a large company that's sort of like HAL, but you know, if you're familiar with Space to that or Space Odyssey 2001, but it's just one <laughs> letter ahead of that. Sometimes referred to as Itty Bitty Machines Corporation. Well, I heard a discussion from a customer one week. Literally the next week I joined Gartner. This is back in 2005. Spoke with the same customer. They didn't know it was me. They gave me a complete different story about their level of success, even what they use that exact same product for. So this bears out why it's important to get a different way of listening to what the market is saying. So tee us up on our first research data point. 
Yeah. But before I before I tear that up, I just want to kind of talk about the number for a second. Yep. I want to be very clear and make sure that we know we're not trying to disparage any other research that's out in the industry. There's there's a lot of great research where there's some independent analysts that Dave and I each have a lot of respect for. Um, but their normal report is typically an N of around 300 or 400 usually on the average. So then the question becomes, why does Veeam um, pay to go get 3,400 responses. And the answer for that is, is that if a global report has 300 on it, okay, that's, that's, that's good data. We have 300 in the UK. We have 300 in Australia, New Zealand, right? We have 400 healthcare agencies. We have 375 financial institutions. The reason you do 3,400 is not just so that you can get really precise on what the globe is doing on data protection, right. but so that you can define it to understand what are Brits doing different than Germans than French? What are Americans doing different than LATAM? Why is healthcare data protection needs different than public sector? That's why we do a really, really big end. So let's get into, uh, so these are two of uh, our favorite slides, Dave. And the first one is, What's driving change? This is kind of the, you know, one of the big questions out there. Now, uh, the, the question actually reads, which of the following would drive your organization to change its primary backup solution? So why would you change, right? And, and that's a choose all that apply. That's the blue or green lines on the right-hand side. And then um, the short lines is which of these factors is more important, is most important. So it's a choose all and then it's choose one. Again, the whole report comes out in 15 days on February 22nd. Please mark your calendars for that. Uh, but let's go ahead and tear into this. Now, there's there's a lot of data in this. So, Dave, how about we break this into um, a, a couple sub themes? Because there's a couple things that are adjacent to each other, and I think it tells some interesting stories for what organizations are looking for in 2022. You want to take the first one? Sure, absolutely. And I should mention that we've been using essentially this exact, well, this exact same question, but right. essentially the almost the same responses. It's over 80%, maybe it's closer to 90% exact same responses now going on three years. So we've got some interesting telemetry data around year over year comparisons and to your point, Jason, in specific geographies, even verticals, etc. So if we dissect this a little bit, you know, it's always interesting to look at the boundary conditions. Let's raise our eyes to the top. What percolates up to the top, even though you can semi-argue we've got a three-way tie for number two. But first and foremost, what would make me swap out my backup solution is to improve my recovery point and recovery time objectives or basically to better meet my service level agreements. Yep. We've commented on this before, you know, this, especially taking with the second one, meaning improve reliability or success rates of backups, one could view this as a little bit of an incriminating statement on the current notion of the industry, meaning if your entire premise for changing solutions is to get a more successful, reliable solution, then something would have drift in your environment, in your configuration, your product didn't keep up, you've overtaxed the environment, something is not working, right? Yeah, and actually that last nugget, I think, is probably the one that's probably the less condemning of the batch, right? So let's presume that most products, if you put them on a test bench with brand new clean servers, that most of them in theory will back stuff up, right? The problem is, is that as organizations have really accelerated the modernization of production, Right, we're not in just uh, um, VMware on uh, little two U blades or or uh, or pizza boxes in the data center. As we have accelerated modernization of production, in a lot of cases, protection has not kept up. And so, when I look at those top two options around improving RPO RTO and improving reliability, what it really comes down to for me is simply just qualitative improvement. And my guess is in most cases, it's about um, uh, production uh, modernization, outpaced protection modernization. Yes. And so I think that's really, really interesting. Um, that's qualitative improvement. But if you're gonna talk about, let's call it quantitative now, the next meta trend, if the first meta trend was the first two, let's Nick, take a look at the, how about the next two and then skip a couple down. We get change from CapEx to OpEx. So we have a consumption issue. We have improved the ROI TCO. So that's a value issue. And then if you skip down two more, you get reduced hardware and software costs. So that's a price issue. So I'd argue that certainly the second macro trend still comes down to economics, right? right? Consumption, value, cost. 
So the primary driver is qualitative improvements. Got to work better. The second one, um, uh, I need to get more value out of it, and I'd really like to pay less. And I think for a lot of organizations, that's going to kind of lean us into um, cloud and alternative delivery models. Yeah, w well said. And it's pretty interesting. You know, my challenge with the current solution is I, I'm having a hard time or not easily meeting my service levels and or having a difficulty uh, with meeting the actual backups. And we've joked in the past, but it's very true, hard to restore that of which you have not backed up. So that's why backup success becomes vitally important. It, everything triggers off of that. So we have a product or implementation challenge, which then begets an economic consumption model, perhaps challenge as well. And before I go too much further, I'm being told maybe we want to hit the map just one quick time. I know we've got a lot of folks that have come in. There you Always go. It's awesome when we see some of these big countries like Canada, like uh, Russia come in. But we've got Canada and the United States, also Ohio, the state joining us in uh, New Hampshire as well. See, let's see what us. Oh, here we go. We've got Slovakia, Czech Republic, Germany. Uh, we go over, we can, of course, saw Russia. We see Egypt. Jason, it, Egypt might be one of the first ones or first times we've seen them pop up. Oman, uh, India, I nice. uh, should mention as well. So always good to see folks over there. Appreciate you tuning in. We'll keep those comments coming. And if you have any questions as well, feel free to present those. So sorry for the quick interrupt, Jason. Just want to give a little level set of where okay. we're at. So notion on economics totally makes sense, especially in somewhat of a pandemic time. Some people are recovering, but it's challenging times really probably for all from a financial perspective. So we've got a service level per issue. We've got a financial pain point, maybe issues too strong, but it's a driver for sure. It rates Absolutely. high. Where do we go from there? So third one up, let's talk about better capabilities and reducing complexity. This actually brings you back to many of the C's, Dave, that um, that you have quoted for oh so many years um, in our industry. Um, but let's, if we're looking on the list, uh, we start off with moving from an on-premise to a cloud backup solution, which is in that number five spot, um, using different tools for different workloads, right? So it wasn't that many years ago. And, and Dave, I think for the first two decades that each of, I, of us were in this business, it was always about, well, I need one thing. You know, one thing's yes. gonna back up my entire environment. After 31 years, I feel very comfortable in telling you there will never be a single tool that can back up everything um, as best of breed. Maybe single vendor, but it won't be single tool because there's just too much magic secret sauce that has to happen um, for that to happen. So certainly we see um, uh, cloud-based uh, uh, delivery, diversification of tool set in order to give that best of breed to the office administrator differently from the IaaS administrator, differently than the Salesforce administrator, differently from IT ops in general. And then while we're at it, let's reduce complexity, which is mm -hmm. actually kind of goofy, right? Hey, we're going to use separate tools, and yet we still want to reduce complexity in the environment. That kind of leans you back into one management plane, one vendor consumption model, et cetera. So um, lots of interesting stuff that comes in as a tie for that number three spot. Yeah, and you know, on the complexity notion, there's a few ways to, to double click on that. So one of the an analogs that I like to point to is, let's say you use Microsoft Outlook and maybe you use Microsoft Office, but you also use Adobe Acrobat and from a PDF perspective and maybe Chrome from a web browser perspective. Those that are, sounds like my desktop. It's a, Yeah, right, those are the industry leading solutions. They have different interfaces. There is ability to do things like import and cut and paste, but my point is always Chrome is a different interface and experience than, say, Outlook. But if you can successfully navigate both of them, and meaning it's not an inhibitor, then that's not inherently a problem. You've addressed, in other words, ease of use without having to have one single unified console, one policy set, et cetera. So I'm going to flip that over. I would have said, uh, you know, maybe uh, there's a reason why most of us did not standardize on WordPerfect um, plus Lotus one two three plus. I mean, uh, what was uh, what was the alternative to PowerPoint? I forget. There, there, there is power in the suite, 
right? And having that consistency of capabilities and the consistency of a buying pattern and the licensing and 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 those kind of things. So having different tools for different purposes, you actually can make pretty decent charts um, in uh, uh, in Excel. I'd rather do them in PowerPoint, please. You so. just successfully erased like two and a half decades of therapy. I'd forgotten about Harvard graphics and Corel <laughs> and uh, other kinds of presentation technologies, oh, but Harvard point graphics. well made. Right. Yes. Yeah, there's a reason the sweet one. It's true. All right, so um, so that's our that's our third macro trend. Now, okay, those are the trends driving uh, data protection. Let's do some myth busting, Dave. So uh, I know this is one of your favorite areas because it's always fun to myth bust when you have 3,300 other IT leaders all agreeing with you. So let's look on the bottom of the list and see what's really not driving um, data protection overall. And I guess maybe it's not a not, but I do think there's something interesting in near the bottom. Um, there's almost equal numbers that are saying, I must be able to deploy as software only, and I must be able to deploy as an appliance, right? It turns out that the change driver is not about form factor. Right. Mm -hmm. I would argue customers want choice. Right. Yes. For some folks, the ease of complexity in day zero is uh, is a black box with blinky lights. And for a lot of other folks, it's like I already got metal. Would you just give me the software that I need to do my job? And so I think power of choice is 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 it's on the bottom. It's not the definition of why you're changing. It's just a buying driver. Yeah, it's a good point. It also, you know, going back in history, it reminds me about maybe it was eight years ago, a vendor asked me, hey, could you start doing research on are people moving towards backup appliances? They were a backup appliance vendor. What I simplistically put out there is, are you moving interested in moving towards backup appliances or away? The next choice was, are you interested in moving more towards a software, software-defined or software-based solution or away? And it became almost a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, a quarter for two right. years in a row. So I dropped the question. To your point, there's choice either because that's the nature of that company's business, asset management. There's a whole thing, number of things that go into it, but it's not one size fits all. Yeah. So um, back at the old firm that I used to be at, I had that similar ask. Might have been from the same vendor who was trying to make their case, actually. Um, and uh, and we asked questions of those folks that were using appliances. Why did they move towards an appliance? And the top answer was simplicity. Mm -hmm. And then we asked organizations that were not using appliances that built their own. And we said, why do you drive? Why do you use your own in seven appliance? We asked both of them why they chose their their half of the coin. And they said, Dave, simplicity. Right. Uh, and which was amazing to me. So so you can judge simplicity based on I want a single skew or you can judge simplicity by I want consistency of metal. So I'm right. not dropping super micro boxes into my all Cisco UCS shop. Right. So both sides thought they were getting the same thing. And, and I just thought that was um, bordering on comical. All right. But Dave. This is one of the two slides that we yep. want to cover today. And um, and uh, I've shared on the stream before, I do a lot of stuff with scouts. Uh, and I know you're a big hiker uh, as well. Um, and so whenever you plan a hike, there's there's three things you want to know. Where you, where are you coming from? Where are you going to? And then you can figure out how you're going to get there, right? So this is the where you're coming from. What's going to change yep. uh, uh, where you, what your current status is. Let's talk about what customers say they're going to. And so our next slide is really asking the question, what would you consider to be the defining aspects of modern or innovative uh, data protection or data management for your organization? So that's the long green lines, choose all that apply. And then in the short lines, if you are going to buy a new solution today, what is the most important attribute? Right. And uh, and again, so we get a couple just like last time, we get some some macro trends that comes out of this. And and Dave, I'll, I'll tee up the first trend and let and then have you tear it down for us. The first trend seems to be all around cloudification. Um, yeah. and I, I'm hoping that's a word, but the top choice is around leveraging uh, disaster recovery as a service or perhaps just infrastructure as a service for the sake of disaster recovery scenarios. So that's first and foremost of what modern data protection looks like. Modern data protection includes the cloud as part of your DR strategy. And then the second one, and I love this one, is the standardization of protection between on-premise and SaaS and IaaS policies, which I think is interesting because the last slide showed us that one of the interesting drivers is they're trying to find best of breed tool sets. They're also trying to reduce complexity. And here, where they're going to, they want standardization across that. What are your thoughts on that, Dave? 
Yeah, it makes sense. And, you know, one thing we should probably highlight, it's been our thesis, Jason and myself, that when it comes to modern, it doesn't mean that something that's not on this list is low or not wanted. It just means they think that they have that need well met or that it can multi-source that. In other words, you know, if, if every car is reliable, then the decision criteria becomes something else. And so to your point here, if the issue around what's actually modern, then is I want to do something new or expand into a different kind of way of handling the business. Disaster recovery, unfortunately, as you point out in the past, Jason, is oftentimes overlooked, some cases till it's too late. Yep. So DR rising to the top of the list is a recognition of the fact that more and more people don't think they fully have that covered. Yeah, and I, I love the fact that the top two options really encompass almost all the hybridity um, that you would get in in a modern 2022 IT architecture, right? So the top one is around um, using hybrid architectures for data protection. The second option is recognizing that um, that uh, modern production is also hybrid, right? So I love that. But take a look, uh, what's it, fifth option down. I think this one's really cool because a lot of people won't touch this one with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> and and let's so and let's let's put on our Veeam hats for just a second. The ability to move workloads from one cloud to another, right? I mean, you can go to Amazon and they'll give you a tool to get you from data center to Amazon, right? Not back again, just to Amazon. Um, Azure, same kind of thing. It'll get you to Azure, same thing to Google, right? But the idea of actually being able to move workloads from one cloud to another, ain't no hyperscale gonna give you that, Dave. That's my Texas coming out um, on that one. Um, but this is one that you talk a lot about around uh, around data portability and, and flexibility, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think if what we've learned in the last two years has provided any indication of what we need to consider in the future, it is that we have to overcome data gravity. We have to be able to flex the business sometimes for unanticipated consequences or in reaction to changing business models, changing asset management, constraints, changing supply chain constraints, etc. I do want to give a quick shout out. Thank you, Mark, for commenting on the guitars. He says he's got a number of the same Van Halen guitars back there. Th appreciate that shout out. We do, if we hit the map just quickly before we double click further on this, we've got a couple other areas that have come in. Uh, another additional Coloradan, so welcome to the show. El Salvador has come in in Central America which is pretty neat. That's also might be one of the first times we've had that. If you look down just below the from, you'll see that green there for El Salvador. So welcome over in Europe, United Kingdom, another Romanian in addition to our tech team, uh, Thailand, India, additional in India, like th three plus more, and then South Africa as well. And I'm sorry, I almost forgot, but Turkey has come in as in addition. So super oh, shout fantastic. out there to your point, Jason, you know, I think if we look at some of this list, let's go on to our next one, because we're going to see some additional kind of ways people want to flex their recovery solutions. Now, but by the way, boy, I just want to point out, uh, you know, Mark, Dave, I have the same guitars <laughs> that you two have as well. I just thought I'd point that out while I'm here. So it's Dave. cheaper if you buy them in bulk. Yeah, well. I guess you and I bought the same kit um, as a, maybe a starter's kit um, from uh, from Amazon. All right, but let's let's go back to the data. So um, if the first trend is really around recognizing um, hybrid for both protection and production, that second trend, we're looking at the third and fourth options in this list, the ones that are adjacent to each other. We're going to call this the integratability. Um, I probably would yeah. call this the Danny Allen factor, um, if you're honest about it, because what you've got is you've got um, – uh, Integrating data protection along with data security. That's our CTO, by the way. He's a big, passionate cybersecurity guy. Um, and then also um, anything with APIs, right? Anything around integrating backup with the rest of your systems management framework. And Dave, you and I have been talking about this for a long time. The idea of do you really have to go and provision and manage your production resources in one management framework and then step completely out of that and then go over to something else to do protection? Yeah. Couldn't we just do some tags? Couldn't we do some macro um, uh, uh, 
scopes in order to protect that data while it's being productive, really be more SLA driven around that. And then certainly recognizing that ransomware is a disaster, that uh, that your data protection is your last line of defense in a cybersecurity strategy. Um, what can we do to make those better citizens with each other? That seems to be that second set of trends really around integratability of data protection within the broader scope. Yeah, and I like that. To me, that that's a nice definition of what modern is, meaning backup is no longer a silo in and of itself. There was a time when backup was viewed as being very discreet from DR, and now what we're seeing is backup is not viewed as being sort of orthogonal from other practices within the data center, be it security, be it reporting, be it application development or DevOps or whatever kind of ops you want to throw into that. So yep. I like the notion of a backup becoming more of a full class citizen in the ecosystem in the data center or in the hybrid multi-cloud world. Yeah, so, and uh, we got just a few minutes left. So our third trend of, of what does modern or innovative look like, um, it looks like more than just backup. Right. Yeah. So if you're looking down the list, so we're now in the numbers five and six or uh, six and seven slots, the ability to use production data for secondary purposes. Now, that can be DevOps, that can be forensics after a cyber event, patch testing, uh, risk mitigation, anything around just be smarter. Right. With how you're using that data for secondary goals. And then right next to that is automating recovery workflows. And again, I'm going to call this part of that smarter factor. Right. So it's not just about I'm going to break out that three ring binder and recreate the steps in order to get my production environment running. No, I'm going to script the whole darn thing and then I'm going to have it automatically test that script. And that way, when I really need it, I can just hit that magic green button um, and the scripts are just going to fire. And I know that my disaster is going to work um, correctly um, each time. And while we're at it, just to kind of round off our list, let's do some myth busting. So it's not that these last two things are um, are less important, right. um, but what I would argue is these are these are table stakes now. These are things that a few years ago might have been perceived as modern or innovative, but today they're mostly just table stakes. And that is moving from on-prem to a cloud. As we said earlier, you know, you can get that from any hyperscale you like, you know, getting it to a cloud is not that hard of a trick. We do that, too. We just do it better with instant VM recovery anyway. Um, and then the last one is is uh, is cost consumption model, which I think is interesting because people say this is one of the things they're moving from. And yet it's actually not where the innovation comes from. It is still table stakes on that side. But Dave, let's talk a little bit about, about doing smarter, right? That that data reuse, data forensics, and then also orchestration. You talk to a lot of enterprise CXOs. Is that what you're hearing? Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, recovery is considered something of a sunk cost. You know, it's the insurance policy. You hope you never have to cash. Sure. And if, if it works well, because the infrequency of re recovery and if recovery is going well, very few people in the organization actually knows that's taking place, then it's easy to hide, be out of sight, out of mind. Ransomware certainly turns that on its head, meaning now you could have to recover a great deal of data and everybody knows that they're impacted. But aspirationally, if we think about sort of carrot and stick, stick or the negative aspect of this is I just have to be able to recover from a cyber event or a randomized equipment failure. Someone made a mistake. Aspirationally, where can the business derive more value? How can they leverage this data without impacting production? Yep. How can they basically take a data management, data movement engine and migrate maybe test workloads into a production environment which resides elsewhere or even pull workloads back, now we're seeing new use cases which really do percolate up higher in the data center. Man, I love how you said that, right? I mean, if you, if you don't think about Veeam and the little companies that want to be Veeam, if you don't think about us as a backup product, if you think about us as a data mover that allows for the reinstantiation of that data, there's the reactive cases like backup and recovery, but there's all those proactive use cases as well, like migration to a cloud, migration between clouds, data forensics after a cyber event. All of those things just unlock incremental value at no additional price, as long as you're not getting gouged by the other vendors along the way. So anyway, this is uh, this is week one of four um, for our sneak peek series, right? So this week we wanted to look at where are people leaving from and then what are they going to when they're looking for modern data protection? Uh, we've got three more weeks of this, Dave, and right after week three, um, the data actually publishes February 22nd. 
um, uh, please uh, please mark down your calendars and and uh, we'll continue to sneak peek until then. Yeah, well said. So this is just but a small portion of the research will be teeing up. Speaking of teeing up, this Friday, our great friends in Product Strategy Office of the CTO, Rick Vanover, Kirsten Stoner, they're going to be discussing Veeam's NAS backup and recovery. They're going to revisit that. NAS, Jason, may sound a little bit, you know, hasn't everybody done that for some time? File shares and network attached storage. But a couple of years ago, Veeam came out with an independent way to offer changed file tracking. So whether it's QNAP or NetApp, whether it's uh, low-end file shares, simply something on a Windows box all the way up to Isilon, how can we extract that kind of capability independence and provide value across the whole gamut? They're going to yep. double-click on that and more. Be sure to check it out. And thanks for tuning in. Stay safe, stay positive, and we'll see you next week.